Hey, welcome everyone to uh, our Northern California and Nevada Pastors and Leaders Conference. It's good to see you guys. Welcome. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to thank you so much for adopting us into your family. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a new name. We thank you, God, that you've called us to yourself. We're so blessed, Lord, to be able to serve you. But we thank you, Lord, that before we ever are called servants, we're called friends. And we're called sons and daughters. We're called children of God. We are so thankful for the new birth. Lord, that the way that you communicate your acceptance of us is with those, that double metaphor, we're chosen and adopted, and we're also born, that uh, neither one is sufficient to express your love and your commitment to us by itself. We're so blessed, Lord. We're so thankful that you love us, that you want to commune with us. We're so thankful that you create times like this for us and space like this for us where we can just lay stuff at your feet cast our cares upon you, come to you if we're tired and heavy laden to find rest. We ask you, Lord, to pour out your spirit on us. We want to pray, Lord, we know that there are many pains here. There's, there's needs for physical healing. We know that there's trauma. We know, Lord, that some maybe are really going through the ringer and have gone through so much they barely got here. And maybe there are some that are still trying to get here. They're, they're going through it. And so we just would ask you, Lord, to be so faithful as our shepherd to come and lift every burden, to come and touch every heart, and that you'd use us, Lord, also to bear one another's burdens, that we would truly be a loving family. And so pour out your spirit on us, Lord. And even now as we sing, we just want to start off with just rejoicing and, and drawing near. So meet us, Lord. Meet us in a wonderful way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just go right into the word. So... We have Pastor John Randall. He's going to start us off, and um, as he comes up here, uh, on your uh, name tag is a, a Bible verse that the Lord put on our heart um, when we were praying about it. This conference, uh, actually it was Tim Brown, when we were in prayer, he, he uh, had this, I think he had just finished teaching on this section in Leviticus, or had recently taught on it, and, and uh, the verse that a fire shall always be burning on the altar, and it, it will never go out. And there's a there's a wonderful reality in the New Covenant that while in the Old Covenant for that fire to keep burning on the altar, there was a lot of human effort. Someone had to plant a vineyard and, or, you know, olive yard and grow the olives and someone had to harvest them and someone had to press them and someone had to refine it and someone had to haul it and priests had to carry it and they had to store it and load it. But, you know, we're Calvary Chapel and part of our DNA is Zechariah chapter 4 and that magical lampstand that is connected by the golden pipes to the two trees and the oil is just constantly flowing and the lamp is constantly burning not by might and not by power but by my spirit and what we've been praying for for this conference is i don't want to say the word rekindling but just that re that re reminder of the reality that a, a fire that started from heaven you know how could it ever go out if God started it, how could it ever go out? The Jesus movement, how could that ever stop? If Jesus is going to build upon a rock, the rock of his identity, if he's going to build his church, how could the gates of hell prevail against that? <laughs> who's going to tell Jesus no when Jesus says yes? And who's going to tell him yes when he says no? Who's going to open when he shuts? And who's going to shut when he opens? And just thinking also, one of the other words I think the Lord gave us as we were praying was, that coal of fire when Isaiah was standing amongst the people of unclean lips. Do you feel like you're standing amongst the people of unclean lips? You been paying attention to the election? Do you, feel like, do you feel like you're standing in the midst of some unclean lips? Like everything that comes out of anyone's mouth is so unclean. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And there was a solution, wasn't it? Wasn't there a solution? An angel an angelic being, a holy angelic being in the presence of God who never ceases to say holy, holy, holy. He comes and with tongs, he can't even touch it with his own hand. With tongs, he takes fire and he touches a man with fire. And then a man could be used by God. Fire from heaven. 
a fire that will never go out. And we're, we're just praying for a sweet visit with Jesus during this time and just longing for all of us to be encouraged and built up and strengthened. And so maybe you, you came here and there, you're, like, you're like, I think I'm that smoldering flax. You know, may the Lord just, just blow that breath of God and just that fire. Maybe you're feeling alone and maybe you get around some other hot coals. Man, I'm already so blessed. Registration, I could, we could end the conference. Registration was so awesome to me. I spent about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes talking to John Cowan, and I thought, man, I'm good. I'm good to go. <laughs> uh, so encouraged just by the fellowship. So we're just looking forward to uh, a, just a great time with the Spirit, with Jesus, with the Father. So let's welcome John Randall to come and give us a word. Well, thank you so much. It is a blessing to be back here with you this year and been so looking forward to this time in the Word of God and spending time in fellowship. As Rich said already, I feel encouraged. Most of us on Monday, um, some of us, we quit the ministry Monday uh, because, and we're, we, go th- we, run, we run our message through the grid. We run the service through the grid of, did I do it right? I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, or somebody said, why did you say that? Your wife, you wonder, you ask her, what did you think of it? What I think of what? The, the message. <laughs> what message? The one I gave. Oh, that message. It was good. And you wonder, like, when you say good, do you mean like, like on the scale of one to ten, good? Like, where are we? It was about a five. No, your wife would never say that to you. <laughs> She's encouraging, and so is mine, but I, I just, so I know how you feel on Monday, uh, and I, I, I feel that, but I'm so glad I'm with you guys on Monday because you know how I feel. It's not like you can sit around and talk with everybody about how you feel on Monday, but here you can. And so what I'd like to do is let's open up our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to be looking, beginning in verse 6. But as you're turning there, I want to remind you of something that we can easily forget, and that is this. Jesus didn't save you, and he didn't save me because we had something to offer him. He saved us because we needed to be saved, and he loves us. And Jesus didn't call you into ministry because of all of the the great gifts that you had to offer him. And you were such a find. No, he called you. First and foremost, listen carefully, because he, he wanted you to be with him. And your identity and my identity is not in the church that you pastor It's not even in the the movement of churches that you're a part of, that we're a part of. Our identity has to be in Christ. And for me, coming to this conference, I want to be reminded of who I am in Jesus. Not as a pastor, just as a man. Just as a man who is as in need of Jesus as the day I started walking with Jesus. I am still in need of him, and I want to know who I am in Christ. And I pray that this week we would all come away with just being more in love with our Savior. Just coming back to first love, what it is to just, just to know him. When it wasn't about studying for some passage, when it wasn't about counseling some people, when it was just about knowing Jesus and loving Jesus. And everything else is an overflow of that. Rekindle that fire, Lord, in my own heart. The books of 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, you know, they are pastoral epistles. And Paul wrote these letters to his co-laborers who were in the ministry. And found within these pastoral letters are important instructions on how to oversee the work of the ministry. How to raise up leadership within the church. The qualifications that are to be met in order for someone to serve in a leadership capacity. There's even instructions how to handle circumstances that are difficult. Even divisions that could arise within the church. Of course, the theme of this letter and the real reason that Paul wrote this first letter to Timothy, he told him in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he said, I write to you these things that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God and the pillar 
and ground of truth. That was the reason for the letter. But what I want to focus on just in our time together is what makes a good minister. In beginning in verse 6, if you'd follow along with me. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and we suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe these things command and teach. Perhaps you feel that planting a church in the city that you live in is difficult. I believe that the ancient city of Ephesus would have been a tough place to plant a church, for within the city of Ephesus was one of the seven known wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Artemis to the Greeks and Diana to the Romans. And temple prostitutes led the worship of this goddess of fertility. And the people of Ephesus were also given over to the magical arts of witchcraft and practiced them regularly. And Paul ended up staying in that city over two years, ministering faithfully, preaching and teaching the word of God. And a church was planted there. And now the church was in need of direction, strong leadership to help navigate through the challenges that they were facing. And Timothy was sent by Paul for this very reason to help and to assist them. And one of the difficulties was the influence of false teachers. It was one thing to have to contend with all of the immorality and the cultic practices of the day. But they also had to contend with the combination of Jewish legalism as well as Eastern asceticism that had made its way into the congregation. And sadly, Paul would write and say there were some that were in the church that had actually given audience to these men and started to turn away from their faith in Christ. In light of the adversity that Timothy was facing, Paul gives him instruction on how to be a good minister in difficult circumstances, which raises the question, what makes a good minister? What classifies a person as a successful servant within the kingdom of God? Is it the size of the church? Is it the influence of the ministry? Is it how many books he's written? Is, is it any of these things? Does that matter? So often the criteria that we use in estimating a minister's effectiveness isn't even biblical. Yet found within this section of 1 Timothy are the qualities that make for a good minister. And, and I'm sure that there's not a person in here that doesn't want to be a good minister, that wants to hear Jesus say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And this doesn't just apply to pastors in the pulpit. This applies to people serving in any area of ministry. A husband, a good husband, a good wife. A son, a daughter, how to be an effective servant in the kingdom of God. And if you maybe you take notes, this might help you. You might want to write these things down. First of all, a good minister presents the word of God consistently. Paul tells Timothy in verse 6, if, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister. The word for instruct there means to remind, to suggest. It could literally mean to lay before the people. Timothy would be a faithful and effective servant by consistently laying before the people the truth of God's word. To put it another way, a faithful minister, a good minister, reminds the people consistently of what God says. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for to me to write these same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. Paul saying, I'm saying this to you again because you need to be reminded of it. And I'm going to consistently remind you of it. Peter said much the same thing. 
You remember Peter in his second epistle in the third chapter in the first verse? He said, Beloved, I write to you now this second epistle in both which to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. A good minister faithfully, consistently tells God's people what God's word says. Sometimes that means encouraging people from God's word. Other times that means warning people from God's word. But to be effective, we have to proclaim and teach the word of God. You say, of course, that's what we do. That's elementary. Everybody knows that. Well, there is a danger to replace solid biblical exposition, teaching, and preaching of the Word of God with other things. There are alternative things that are being used, from gimmicks to programs to positive pep talks that lack power. And every time a minister stands before God's people without presenting God's Word, the church and its people are weakened in their faith, and furthermore, they are ill-equipped and not prepared for the spiritual battle that we're in. Watered-down preaching mixed with psychological platitudes, will always leave God's people starving for more. When all the hype settles, when, when everything, you know, the dust settles and all of that, people, people at the end of the day, they need something to hold on to. They need an anchor for their soul. I mean, they need something that's going to get them through. Like the mother that texts me today when I arrived here. My son just called me. What should I do? He says he doesn't want to live anymore. I mean, what, what am I going to say? Well, you know, you need to sit down and just kind of... I mean, you, they, they need something concrete. They need something solid. I don't have anything in myself to give, but I have the Word of God to give, and that's what we hold on to. And some of you here at this conference, no doubt, that's what you're holding on to. You're holding on to a verse. You're holding on to a Word that God gave you. And that's why you faithfully show up every single week, whether it's your midweek or your home fellowship or in your church meetings, wherever you're gathering, and you faithfully present the Word of God. And here's what Jesus says concerning that. You're a good minister. You're a good minister. Maybe you don't feel like you're the best teacher. Maybe you feel like you're not completely qualified. Here it says if you consistently do what God's called you to do, he says you're a good minister. And I'll I'll take the approval of Jesus any day. That's why at Calvary Chapels, we place a high priority on teaching the word of God. God's word is living, it's powerful, it can change people's lives. You know what it's like. You know the difference that it makes in your life when somebody comes into your fellowship and they tell you after a service, that, that ministered to me. Sometimes we think, well, what, what part ministered to you? <laughs> and, they say, and they say something that you didn't even say. And you think, wow, the Lord was, must have been working in spite of me. But nonetheless, when God is working in people's lives and they're being fed, or they say, I've learned more here in three months than I learned in 10 years Wherever I, I mean, it just, it, it's something that you just feel like we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And it, it may not be the flashiest thing, and, and it may not be the, the most popular thing, and, but, but it's what God's given us to do, and we're doing it faithfully. We teach the Word of God. If we want people to be the best loved, best fed sheep, then, then to the best of our ability, we have to present the Word of God so that we can be good ministers. Paul felt so strongly about this in his second letter to Timothy. In chapter 4, he said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the, who will judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. What was Timothy to do? Preach the word. He had to faithfully preach the word. A good minister presents the word of God faithfully. Listen, don't, don't stop teaching through the word of God. Keep teaching the Old Testament. Keep teaching the New Testament. Take them through the Bible. And when you're done, come back around and start over. Teach the word of God. You'll be a good minister. The second thing I find, in order to be a good minister, we have to receive the word of God personally. For it says in verse six, nourish in the words of faith, and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. For Timothy, to be a successful servant, he not only had to tell the people what God's word said, he had to personally follow what God's word said in his own life. He had to be personally nourished in the words of faith and good doctrine in order to present good doctrine. He not only had to present the word, but he had to practice the word. And the word for nourish 
means to feed. It feeds the soul. Timothy would be constantly giving out, giving out, feeding people the word of God consistently, but he would also need to be fed himself. And this is something that every single pastor has to guard in their own life. Personal time spent with Jesus, not for sermon preparation, not not to find something to give to the people, but something to receive For yourself, spending time with the Lord nourishes you, feeds you, strengthens you. It provides the necessary food that you need for that day. You remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It was Jeremiah that said in Jeremiah chapter 15, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Too many Christians today are spiritually malnourished because of an improper spiritual diet. They're not feeding upon the word of God. But what about the minister himself? Is the minister, is the pastor still devotionally connected to the Lord, just getting up and and meeting with the Lord early? Maybe you've kind of gotten away from that. Maybe the fire of your devotional life has gone out, not because the Lord doesn't want to meet with you, but you just something's going on in your life and you just kind of put that on the back burner, as it were. And the Lord's saying, listen, you need to get back to that. All the ministry that flows out of your life is an overflow of abiding in Christ. Get back to just reading the word, going through it, highlighting it. Maybe it's time for you to get a new Bible in the sense of maybe one that's not so marked up and then you go through it and you start marking it up all over again. And it's brand new. Sometimes your eyes tend to gravitate toward what you already have seen and what you've already done. Man, make it fresh. Get back to that. Feed on the word of God personally. It was Job that said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured his words, the words of his mouth, more than my necessary food. In Job chapter 23, Timothy was nourished by God's word, which were the words of faith and sound doctrine. And these things Paul said that Timothy had carefully followed. Here's what I know about myself. As a Christian, I can survive without many things, but I cannot survive without without the word of God. I can't make it. I could never make it. And for Timothy and for us to be good ministers, not only do we present the word of God faithfully, but we are nourished by the word of God personally in our own lives. It's the only thing that's going to sustain us. How important that is. But I also find in verse 7 that the good minister maintains his focus. For in verse 7 he says, but reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. In direct contrast to the sound doctrine that was to be received by Timothy, he was exhorted to reject or to literally have nothing to do with that which was profane or worldly, meaning that which is radically separate from what is holy. Timothy couldn't lose his focus. Paul's saying, don't don't get sidetracked into old wives' fables. Don't don't get tripped up in this thing and and this diversion. Stay the course. Make sure you're, you're, you're staying focused in what you're doing. There were some strange teachings that were circulating and infiltrating the church that had no biblical basis whatsoever. And Paul says, don't have anything to do with it. Don't waste your time on it. Even, even Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, and he said, I fear. For some of you that you've, you've departed from the simplicity that is in Christ, don't, don't get diverted from it. And you know how it is, Pastor. Again, I'm speaking to ministers. You know how it is when people come with the, the newest thing that they, did you, Pastor, did you read this thing? No, I haven't read it. And it's some, the newest, the latest thing that's come out. And, and I just, I don't, I don't get diverted from that. I don't get diverted and follow after that. I have to stay focused. And there's so many things on a, on a weekly basis that can divert our attention from, from the main thing that we're supposed to be doing. And as a, as a good minister, I have to maintain focus. There's certain things that have to remain in the peripheral and, and there's certain things that I have to look at and stay focused on. A good minister teaches the word to the church, reads the word of God for himself, but he maintains his focus. What, what's your, what are you focusing on right now? I mean, sadly, there are some ministers, and Rich alluded to it, and I, I think in, in one sense, they're just, they, are in, they are wrapped up in the whole political thing. Listen, our people know all about the political scene. They, 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 they know that hopefully, you know, some people are just looking to the White House. We need to be pointing people to God's house. And so it's really important that we keep doing that. Let's, let's talk less about the candidates and more about Christ. I mean, that's something that needs to be happening in our churches. People don't need to get up there and have you, you know, regurge all CNN nonsense. What they need to hear is what God's word says. 
They need to have their eyes looking toward the hills from where, where their help comes from. They need to know that Jesus is coming back soon. They need to be reminded that we're to be evangelizing, that the, that the harvest is ripe, the labors are few. There's work to be done. Let's not get distracted. Let's not lose our focus in the church. Let's keep our eyes on Christ. And let's keep doing what we're called to do. Amen? Salt and light in this world, like a city that's set on a hill. Yes, we exercise our freedoms. Yes, we do what we've been called to do. And and we're thankful for the sacrifices that men and women have made to enable us to have those liberties. But we realize that we're ambassadors of another kingdom altogether. A city whose builder and maker is God. Therefore, we have to maintain our focus as we lead. This is so important. But I also find to be a good minister, it's important that we are disciplined. And discipline isn't a bad thing in this regard. It's a good thing. It says in the second portion of verse 7, it says, and exercise yourself toward godliness. Bodily exercise, it profits a little. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. It was extremely important for Timothy to remain spiritually disciplined in Ephesus. And so Paul says to him, Timothy, you need to exercise yourself toward godliness, because that's profitable for all things. The word exercise here, where we get our English word gymnasium, it means to train. It means to exercise. The the word speaks of a a rigorous, strenuous, self-sacrificing training that an athlete goes through. That's what Paul was trying to impress upon Timothy in the area of discipline. In the Greco-Roman world, the culture there was enamored with the physical body. We just recently went on the Footsteps of Paul tour and uh, went to some of these places that I had never been before in my life. And the epistles just came alive and seeing Ephesus and seeing Corinth and, and seeing some of these places, the island of Crete and Patmos, etc. cetera. And, and it just, it just came, came alive in a new and fresh way. But one thing you're going to find when you go to these places like Athens is they were enamored with the physical body. Everywhere you look, statues. Of naked people. I mean, it's just like, try to teach a Bible study. Church, look over here. For, never mind, look over here for a second. Don't look at that. I am just got so tired of seeing tiny cherubs, you know, with, I just, ah, it's frustrating, you know? Put some board shorts on that thing. It's just wrong. I mean, you just, it's still to this day, statues everywhere in Rome, all over the place. No wonder when Paul went into Athens, he was provoked in his spirit. He just thought, ah, can't look at there anymore. But anyhow, he's telling Timothy, I want you to, to maintain this sense of discipline in a spiritual sense. And I think that's important for us as, as soldiers in the army. Many of you probably served in the military, and you know there was a sense of discipline that was instilled into you, or you competed in athletics, and there, there was a sense of you have to be disciplined in these areas if you're going to be able to be effective in what you're doing. And sometimes we can look at discipline as a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing spiritually speaking, but may I add, physically. Oh, no, don't talk about that. I saw some cookies out there. I want to get after the time we're done. No, listen, Paul was concerned about Timothy's health, and I think that is something that pastors also need to be concerned about. This is very practical, all right? Very practical um, in the sense that we need to take care of ourselves. We need to do the best we can to take care of ourselves. And for us, you know, we sit and we read, and people want to take us out to lunch, and want us to eat more and more. And then we go back and we sit and read, read some more. My kids got me a watch for my birthday that tells you when to get up and walk around. It's like, oh my goodness, I need to you, get, move. And I'm like, okay, I got to move around. I mean, it's just one of those things. Guys, take care of yourself physically. We, we, this is a temple. We want to serve the Lord as long as we possibly can. So let's be disciplined in the area spiritually, but let's also be disciplined in the area physically within our lives. Those two things going together. Getting the proper rest that you need. Eating the right things. All of these things. I'm not not on a health kick. I'm just saying, let's just be realistic here. And let's take care of ourselves. He says, Timothy, you need to be disciplined in these areas of your life. You remember Paul wrote and he said, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. And they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. And Paul said, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself may become disqualified, remaining disciplined, make sure that we're still accountable, that we're not going out on the fringe or compromising with this or with that. Let's remain disciplined in a godly way so that we can continue to be used by the Lord. We're soldiers, we're active in service, and we can't get entangled with the affairs of this life. 
Paul then says in verse 9 that for a good minister, it's important that he works hard. In verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. For Paul, as well as for Timothy, they were involved in a work that was demanding. And, and you know this to be true, don't you? I, I, know, I know you do. You know that the ministry is physically demanding. You know that it is emotionally demanding. It is spiritually demanding. And it can take its toll. Mentally, physically, all of that. Because we work hard. And we should work hard. We put our hands to the plow and we're not looking back. It's a good work. It's a blessing to do it. Sometimes people say, oh, you don't need to do that. I, I enjoy doing this. I like doing it. It's a blessing to me. I don't see it as a burden. I, I see it as, as a joy. But, but nonetheless, these guys, when they were laboring, it means to work to the point of exhaustion. When, when Paul talks about striving, it's the word where we get agony. He's engaged in the struggle. He's praying over people. He's, he's ministering to people. He's preaching the gospel. He's standing against opposition. He, he's, he's fighting against division. He's writing all these letters. He's in prison. I mean, it was physically demanding on his life, but the guy worked hard at what he did. Sometimes he'd be making tents, and then he'd, some of you guys are bivocational. You have to work a job, and then from the job, then you go to the ministry, and then you go back to the job, and you go back to the ministry, and that's a hard thing to do, but it's a good work, and God says if you're doing it as unto him, you are a good minister. He is well pleased with what you're doing. These guys worked hard. They weren't like the Tekoites in the book of Nehemiah that they didn't put their shoulder to the work, these nobles. No, they, they, they gave it 100%. And that's what ministry needs to be. We don't slide into this. We don't glide into this and think, well, you know, I just kind of kick back and I've got other people to do that. Man, we need to give it 100%. We need to work hard as unto the Lord. It was J. Oswald Sanders that said, if he is willing or unwilling, if a man is unwilling to pay the price of fatigue for his leadership, it will always be mediocre. He said, true leadership always exacts a heavy toll on the whole man. And the more effective the leadership, the higher the price is to be paid. It's a labor. Thankfully, in the midst of the labor, aren't you glad that the Lord gives us the strength that we need, that his sufficiency is enough for us? When you feel like, I can't, I can't do this, God strengthens us in the inner man. Paul would write, you remember in 2 Corinthians, he, he would talk about how all that they suffered, he said, we carried about in our bodies the dying of the Lord. We were dying inside. But the reason we were dying inside is so that we could experience the resurrection power of Christ and wouldn't trust in ourselves. God allows us to feel our own weakness. We sang it today in worship so that we might have his strength. Paul also said that in order to be a good minister, and we're almost through, he said that Timothy had to be an example. For in verse 12, he said, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. We know from other passages of scripture that Timothy was somewhat hesitant to engage in any kind of confrontation. We know that he was a young man. Some believe he was anywhere between the ages of 35 to 40. That would have made him a young man in the ministry at that time compared to those who were elders. And the Ephesian church was troubled by some of the false teachers, and it almost appears that some in the leadership in the church were giving Timothy a hard time because of the fact that he was younger. And so Paul says to him, don't let anybody despise your youth, Timothy. The word despise means to, to feel contempt toward you. Don't let it happen anymore. What was Timothy to do? Was he to assert himself? Are you despising me? What was he to, to kind of get in somebody's face and, and make them demand respect? You know, when, I, uh, when the Lord called me into the ministry, I was a younger man. Um, I was uh, 23 at the time. And I remember when I first had my first assignment as an assistant pastor and, and you would have these counseling appointments that would come in and on a particular day, you, you would be the person that, if anybody came in, you were the person they would come to see. That was kind of the assignments that we were given. And I remember sitting in an office and someone saying, hey John, so there's a person coming in. I mean, just cold call, don't know who it is, don't know what the situation is, they're gonna come see you. And they're coming down to the office right now, all right. And they would come in and they'd sit down. And, and I always knew how it was going to go in the first couple of seconds because they had a look on their face. And the look was like, 
Am I in the right room? Is this the children's ministry or is there something somewhere else I'm supposed to go? Where's, where's the pastor that I'm supposed to, I, they told me I was supposed to come down here and meet with somebody. Yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm here. I'd love to. Oh, it was just this awkward feeling. Then, then you know, when I, we were, I just turned 25. My wife and I, we, we went out and we planted the first church that, that uh, I pastored there in Florida. And again, just being 25 and people would come in and, and they would see us and they, they would say, where, again, where is the pastor? And I, I'd say, I'm here. And I'm, are you the youth pastor? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I would just, I, but I, I was doing both, you know. But, but the thing is, he says to Timothy, don't let anybody despise your youth. Don't let it happen. But how, how do you do that? What if people are despising you in your church right now? What if there are people that just look at you like, you don't, you don't know what you're doing? What, where, where are you from? Where did you come from? What, what are you supposed to do? I, I love what Paul says here, and this has ministered to me so much over the years. He tells Timothy, what you're supposed to do is to be an example. You be an example to the people. You don't have to assert yourself. You don't have to demand that they respect you. This word, for example, means a figure formed by an impression, the pattern in conformity to which a thing must be made. Timothy was to be an example that was to be imitated. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow my example, in other words. Timothy, you be an example. In what way? In what way was he to be an example to the people? First of all, he says, in what you say, the words you speak in your speech, how you, how you respond to people and, and what they say to you. Maybe you got some people in your church who have come in and they're confrontive. How do you respond to them? The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. A gentle tongue breaks a bone. In the things that you say, be an example. What you say to your wife, what you say to your kids, be an example. He also said in your conduct, that is not only in what you say, but how you live. Others may be walking hypocritically, but you and me, we seek to walk holy. We don't just profess to know Jesus. We seek to live for Jesus. And, and that will cause people to respect the fact that you believe what you say, and it shows by the way that you live. Too many pastors saying one thing, living another way. And, and that contradicts what Scripture teaches, and, and people look at us differently. But if we're living... If we're living epistles, known and read by all men, and we're seeking to live and be like Christ, that makes a huge difference. So we want to be an example to our people in that way. Not only in, in your conduct, in your speech, but in love. The word love here is agape. What kind of atmosphere do you have in your church? You can tell pretty quickly when you walk into a fellowship what the atmosphere is like, what the culture is like within that fellowship. Is it an atmosphere of love? Is it an atmosphere of service? You walk into this church and you know this is a place where people know how to serve Jesus because it immediately shows the moment you walk through the door, you know, and that's an example of the pastor that leads in this place. You can just tell right away. And, and you just sense that. What's the culture of your church? Are you an example to the body in love? Are you approachable by your people? Do they have access to you? Are you kind of just one of those people that's kind of like, I don't really, you know, I like to teach and I like to... Go. No, no, no. You need to be accessible. They need to know what it is to be loved by a shepherd. They need to know what it is to, to be able to speak to you and, and to have you interact with them. It's so important. Because long after your, your sermons are done and people don't remember them, they're going to remember how you love them. They're going to remember the time that they called you in the middle of the night and you got in your car and you went down to the hospital and you held their hand when their mother passed from this life to the next. That's what they're going to remember. You be an example in that way. You show them what it is to love by loving he said also in your spirit. That means your attitude. It speaks of an inner enthusiasm. Timothy, when you come into that church, people ought to know you are excited about Jesus. Listen, if you're not enthusiastic about your ministry, nobody else will. You understand? If you come in, oh man, that's all there is today. Pfft, whatever. You know, if that's kind of how you come into your church, don't be surprised if everybody else has that same attitude. Yeah, there's a lot of people on vacation. No, not, not as many as normally have. You know, not as many people today. You know, just this attitude, the spirit of like, listen, there's more people than, than we deserve show up. And the fact that they come back is a miracle to me. I'm, I'm always astounded. You're, you're back. Thank you. And I think they're surprised when I think that. But I do. I think I wouldn't have come back to hear me. But you came back. You're so, you're a blessing. In spirit, you ought to be enthusiastic about what you're doing in the church, no matter what size it is. Listen, when you have a child, when you, when you have a little baby, are you enthusiastic about that baby? You should be. We got a brand new baby. Every phase of the church, whether it's in this infant stage, or it's in the toddling stage, or, or it's in this 
adolescent stage or, or it's in this, you know, whatever it is, we ought to be enjoying it, man, just embracing the moment. I remember when I was pastoring and I had five people and my wife and I were two of the five. And we wanted to leave, you know, and we were there pastoring. And it's like, I remember a buddy of mine, I was just so discouraged. I'm like, what are we doing? This is so lame. This is so weak and powerless. And, and I remember just talking to a friend of mine that had a, a great church, had a Walmart that turned into a church. And I just felt so, I showed up there and I just felt like, what? Well, you have more people in the bathroom than I have on a Sunday morning. If I just had a few more people or a bathroom, I mean, but you know, you know so we're, and you just feel so weak. And I remember him saying, John, listen to me. He said, you need to enjoy every stage of the ministry. It's not always going to be like this. You need to embrace this. You need to love this. You need to, you need, you need to just, you need to just go with what God's doing right now. Stop complaining about it. And start giving it 100%. Be an example in spirit. Isn't it great that five people came? Wow. Praise God. It used to be no one came. Isn't it great that 10 people showed up? Isn't it great that that one person got saved? Isn't it great that, I mean, all of those things. Isn't it great we just baptized somebody for the first time in our church? What a blessing. In faith, be an example that you trust God. We tell people all the time, hey, trust in God. Hey, have faith. God, God's got it. He's going to take care of it. But we have to be an example in that. Not only just telling people to trust God, but trusting God myself. Taking steps of faith. Be an example in that way. Also in purity. Oh, to live in a place like Ephesus where everything was impure for Timothy, he had to be living a pure life. Not get involved with all that was culturally acceptable and everything that everybody was doing, but staying clear of that. Walking in purity, being an example, how important that is. Finally, Paul says, till I come, verse 13, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress might be evident to all. I find that a man who is a good minister or anyone for that matter who's a good servant of the Lord uses the gifts that God's given them to the best of their ability. Every single person in here has a gift that God has imparted to them. And it's important that we use those gifts that God's given to us. Apparently, Timothy, when he was ordained to the ministry, they laid hands on him and some gift was imparted to him. And it almost seems that he allowed that gift to go dormant. And Paul is saying, Timothy, don't neglect that. That was something God gave you and you need to use that. And you know something, whatever God's entrusted to us, one day we're gonna give an account for what we were being entrusted with. If you take that gift and you bury it rather than use it, whatever it is, God says, use those gifts. Stir up the gift of God that's within you. Stop neglecting it. Stop making excuses for it. Stop saying other people are better, they have a, they're better at that gift than I am. Stop saying that. Stop saying that and start using what God's given you for his glory, the best of your ability. Glorify him with that. He gave it to you. Use it. I also find that what makes an effective minister, not only that he uses the gifts that he's been given as unto the Lord, but he, it says here, or at least it's implied in verse 15, that your progress may be evident to all. That is, you keep growing. As a minister, you keep growing. You ever feel like, man, I don't think I can be stretched anymore in my walk with Jesus. I think, I, Lord, I'm stretched out as far as I could stretch, and I'd, I'd like to stop growing now. <laughs> you can't. Paul would say in his own life, I haven't arrived. God's not done with me yet. There's things that God has done in your life, in my life, but there's so much more to do. He began the good work in me. I need to grow. I need to grow in my understanding of who Jesus is. I need to grow in grace. I need to grow in love. I, I, I want to keep growing. I don't ever want to get to that place where I just kind of become stagnant and just, well, this is as far as I'm going to go. I think I've, I've just, I've, I've arrived. You're, listen, we don't arrive until we arrive. But in the meantime, we want to keep growing. Hey, keep stretching yourself spiritually. Keep Keep digging into the Word. Keep going beyond. Keep reading yourself full. Keep praying yourself full. 
keep ministering. Keep, keep stepping out in these areas of faith in, in your community that maybe you've, you've never thought about st- stepping out before. Keep going for it. Keep growing. Don't stop. Well, we kind of, you know, some people, they just grow content. We just got our thing here, and we're not going to, this is it. We're, we're set. We got what we need, and we're just good. We're going to hunker down until Jesus comes. We need, we need to keep growing. God, God didn't just want us to hunker down. He wants us to preach the word. So we, have to, we want to keep growing. Personally, spiritually, in your marriage, whatever. You want to keep growing. Finally, this, I promise, this is the final. <laughs> Verse 16. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in so doing, in so doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. He says, Timothy, you know, he's taking care of the flock. He's taking heed to everybody. But he says, listen, take heed to yourself. Make sure that what you're preaching to others, you're practicing yourself. Take heed. Be mindful of your walk with the Lord. Make sure that you're maintaining that. Keep keep living close to Jesus. Keep living close to your shepherd. Continue in that. And listen, if you continue in that, he said, you're going to save yourself and, and those who hear you. As I said in the beginning, there's not a person in here today that doesn't want to be a good minister. And I'm sure most of us have felt like maybe we've, at times we've failed at being good ministers. Or we could have been a better minister if we just would have. Listen, keep presenting the word to God's people. Keep feeding God's people. Keep yourself in the word personally. Remain focused. Don't get sidetracked on all of these peripheral things that can take us off the the focus of of what we're really here for anyway. Remain disciplined spiritually, physically. Keep growing. Just keep loving Jesus. It'll have an impact not only in your life, but in the people that are, you're ministering to as well. Will you pray with me? And Father, as we pray today, I just want to lift up those who have come here today, Lord, that maybe they are weary. Maybe they've been hearing the lies of the enemy, questioning whether they're a good minister or not. And Lord, your criteria is so different than this world. And even the church so often, Lord, what they think. Lord, we just want to be well-pleasing to you. Lord, we just, we just want to do everything as unto you. We, we want to see you working in and through our lives, through the power of the Spirit. Help us, Lord. We need you, Lord. And as we close today, just in this first session, I just want to start off by saying, listen, if you're if you're weary today, and I know maybe this is just a blanket statement, but, but maybe, I, I mean, some of you really, you know, you just came here, and what we were praying before today, it was just so impressed upon my heart that there, there were those that were coming that may, maybe you just, you're just worn out, man. And I just want to, I want to pray for you today. And I want, I want to see you. I want to know who you are. And, and I just want to ask you by faith just to stand, and I want to pray for you today. If the Spirit of God speaking to you, it might just be one person, maybe a couple people, I don't know. But I just really felt impressed today that there were those brothers, maybe even sisters here, just kind of uh, torn down. Just this season where it just feels like a grind. Like winter every week. You're just plowing, man. You're just going for it. You're just, you're just doing what you can do. And, and, uh, and you just need prayer. I just want to start off this week by addressing those things. Anybody else today? It's kind of where you're at. Anybody else? I'm going to pray for you this morning, this afternoon rather. Those of you that are seated right by these guys, would you just lay hands on them? Would you? Would you just stand up? Lay hands on them. If you see them standing, just get up out of your seat. I want, I want to start by praying for our brothers And every single one of us is going to have a day like that, a season like that. Let's just pray. Father, we come before you together, Lord, as a family, as fellow soldiers in arms, Lord. 
And we pray for our brothers, our sisters today. Lord, you know about every situation that's going on in the church, in the home. You know about the, the discouragements. You know about the struggles. You know about the, the attack. Whatever it is, God, you are so aware. And I want to ask right now that you would strengthen the hands that hang down today. Lord, the feeble knees. Lord, those that feel weak and they just need to sense your grace that is so sufficient. It's the fresh power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Lord, in this moment, I pray as we're in agreement, Lord, that you would do that. And Lord, where there's been fear, I pray that there would be faith. Where there's been anxiety, I pray there'd be peace. Where there's been weakness, God, give strength. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray you continue to just use the rest of this day, Lord, as we seek your face together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Love you guys.